to Intro 101. My name is Chris, and I am your neuroscience and psychology graduate student assistant. I'm here to assist you with the related science basics that you interact with on a daily basis. My goal for doing this is to help you start or continue to build a foundation in human biology and physiology that can better help you engage with the information you consume from your favorite health and wellness educators and influencers. Much like the way a graduate assistant helps prepare intro students so they can better engage with the lectures delivered by their professors. Or maybe you're here today because you are on the edge of your seat from the last episode and are ready to know how in the world you became you. Either way, stick with me for the next few minutes and I'll do my best to explain the physiological events that led to the very beginning of you. Today's episode is Intro to Neurodevelopment 101 Part 2, Fertilization. It is entirely devoted to the hero's journey of your biological parents' gametes up until the moment you became a bunch of rapidly dividing cells. Now, gamete fertilization may not sound like it has much to do with neurodevelopment, but as I said in the last episode, interference with reproductive processes can have downstream effects that could impact fetal neurodevelopment. I will be sticking as closely to basic biology and homeostatic processes as possible, So again, we will look at what can interfere with proper fertilization. And as with any episode, the information I share in this episode, though detailed, it is not exhaustive. So again, please do not use the information presented in this or any of the episodes to self or other diagnose. If you have concerns regarding fertility, please contact a board certified medical professional or a family planning organization that has licensed medical oversight. I'll post any helpful links I know of in the show notes, but if you're aware of any others, do let us know in the comments below. Before we start, I'd like to respectfully acknowledge that Intro 101 is recorded on the unceded and ancestral territories of the Kwantlen, Katsi, Matsui, and Samyamu First Nations. Additionally, we at Intro 101 believe wholeheartedly that science is for everybody. In fact, the richness, complexity, and strength of scientific research is astronomically improved by the inclusion of many varied voices. To help ensure everybody has access to education, research resources, and representation across scientific fields the world over, I will be sharing organizations in the show notes that provide access to STEM education and research resources and ask you to check them out and support them in any way that you can. If you already advocate and generate opportunities to provide equitable access to STEM education and resources within your own communities or support other STEM education organizations not listed here, please share them in the comments below if you'd like others to contribute as they are able. All right, welcome to class. Thanks for being here. Let's crack on with Intro to Neurodevelopment 101, Part 2, Fertilization. First of all, I'd like to mention, if you've just arrived at this channel through this episode, this series is an episodic integration of information that is building a bigger picture of the nervous system, its components, its physiology, and its collaboration with other body systems to keep your body in homeostasis. If you're new to homeostasis and or the nervous system, or a little rusty on how it works, it may benefit you to view the previous episodes in this series. A general understanding of what homeostasis is, nervous system function, general cell physiology, and gametogenesis will help make sense of this episode, all of which are covered in the first six episodes of this series. Okay, let's start with a brief recap of where we left off at the last episode on gametogenesis. Gametes are reproductive cells, and in humans, males, and those who have testes produce sperm cells in a process called spermatogenesis and females, and those who have ovaries, produce eggs, also called oocytes, in a process called oogenesis. In the testes, at puberty, spermatogenesis is awakened by the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis, which speedily launches a continuous and plethoric process of sperm production, leading to the inventory of hundreds of millions of mature sperm cells in the epididymis, which is located in each testis. It takes a number of weeks for a sperm cell to go from germ cell to mature cell, but once that machine is up and running, the testes are churning out and storing around 1,500 mature sperm cells per second. They are not yet motile in storage because they need components in the seminal fluid to give them the capacity and energy to kick off motility. 
Meanwhile, in the ovaries at puberty, some of the primordial follicles that have been dormant in the ovaries since before birth are awakened by the same hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis, and that launches folliculogenesis, which is the part of oogenesis where cohorts of oocytes that are inside follicles will develop until one dominant follicle is chosen for ovulation. Follicles develop considerably less prolifically or expeditiously than sperm cells, but they are chugging along nonetheless. It takes about a year from primordial follicle cohort recruitment to dominant follicle ovulation. Folliculogenesis is an ongoing process from puberty to midlife, meaning multiple follicle cohorts are at varying stages of development at any one time. During ovulation, the dominant follicle ruptures and releases one oocyte from one ovary every 28 days. The leftover follicle shapeshifts into the corpus luteum and gets to business telling the uterus to prepare itself for an incoming, fertilized, and rapidly dividing blastocyst, formerly known as oocyte. It does this by pumping out progesterone, which signals to the uterus to make a cushy endometrial lining that will hold and cuddle the blastocyst. However, if the oocyte is not fertilized, the corpus luteum stops pumping out progesterone and turns itself into scar tissue. The uterus, now being ghosted by the former corpus luteum, says, well, forget you then, and packs up everything and sets fire to it. I'm kidding. It's so much worse. The uterus, no longer receiving any signals to prepare for the blastocyst implantation, lets out a long, sad sigh and tears off its new cushy lining, and in so doing, ruptures tons of newly formed blood vessels. Then, assisted by painful uterine contractions, tissue and blood are continuously expelled out through the vagina for three to six days, sometimes accompanied by a music streaming playlist titled Screaming on the Inside. This happens every month for about 40 years. I kid you not. But this episode is about fertilization, and that leads to pregnancy, which will interrupt the ovarian and menstrual cycles until sometime after baby enters the world. Okay, so let's set the scene for the main fertilization event. And I don't need sultry tunes and mood lighting. I mean, timing, internal environment, and gamete survival. To get to fertilization, there are a few things to keep in mind. First, the female and those with ovaries have a monthly reproductive window of about 24 hours, meaning an oocyte has to be fertilized within 24 hours after its release during ovulation, which occurs on or about the 14th day of the menstrual cycle on average. The male and those with testes, their reproductive window is kind of non-existent, at least as long as they're producing viable sperm, meaning they are not biologically limited to a window of time and are technically capable of providing sperm for fertilization at absolutely any moment, barring any physiological barriers to doing so like post-ejaculation refractory period, which can last anywhere around a few minutes to up to a day. Also of note, sperm cells can survive for days after release. This slightly pads the rather narrow oocyte fertilization window, so something to be aware of if you're not trying to get pregnant. Scheduling intimacy even five days before ovulation may not be the most reliable method of contraception. Another thing to keep in mind is that the vagina is an acidic environment, and importantly so because the vaginal opening is precariously vulnerable to bacteria and pathogens from the outside world. Its antimicrobial defense wants to destroy any foreign invaders. It doesn't discriminate. So the vagina is not super hospitable to sperm cells, even though alkaline components of the seminal fluid are meant to protect the sperm from the acidic environments, many sperm cells will die off before they even reach the cervix. Out of the maybe hundreds of millions of sperm released, it's possible only a few hundred will make it to the oocyte in the fallopian tube. But you only need one to penetrate the oocyte for fertilization to kick off, so with a couple hundred making it that far, odds are pretty good one of them will be able to crack the code. Another important consideration is that sperm cells don't just release on command. The ejaculation of sperm cells requires the coordination of the endocrine system, the central nervous system, and the autonomic nervous system, 
which if you remember from the second episode, it involves involuntary processes and subdivides into three other systems. But the two relevant to this event are the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous systems. So during sexual activity, these systems kick off multiple physiological responses involving hormones and neurochemicals, afferent and efferent neuronal communication, reflex arcs, and penile vasculature in order to accumulate sexual excitement that at its pinnacle will launch a climactic reflex. And that reflex will trigger ejaculation. It has a common name, but I'm trying to get this channel monetized, so I'm intentionally being careful with my words, even though my motivation is entirely educationally driven. I'm not trying to be cryptic, I just don't know what will flag the YouTube content police, so we're going to stick with climactic reflex. Anyway, there are loads of physiological responses involved in reaching this climactic reflex. We aren't going to discuss them all in this episode, but if you'd like a better understanding of male sexual function and health, urology is the field of study, and there are loads of urologists and family planning organizations on the internet, so you can look those up on your own. We will take a brief look at some of the physiology involved in the climactic reflex because that is specifically pertinent to sperm cells being able to exit the epididymis where they are stored. So ejaculation is regulated by the involuntary autonomic nervous system in two phases. The first is emission. The second is expulsion. So for phase one emission, the climactic reflex triggers an autonomic reflex arc between the spinal and pelvic nerve bundles that activates pelvic floor muscle contractions as well as smooth muscle contractions in the epididymis, vas deferens, seminal vesicles, cowper's gland, and the prostate. These contractions help gather sperm cells and all the other fluids from the seminal vesicles, cowper's gland, and prostate that together make up the seminal fluid, which is then deposited in the urethra. Then phase two, expulsion, kicks in, possibly due to the reflex arc in the spinal nerve bundle reaching a firing threshold, but the exact triggering mechanism is not very well understood. Expulsion occurs when the pelvic floor musculature, still under autonomic control, rhythmically contracts to propel the seminal fluid out of the urethra through the penile opening. And it probably goes without saying, but just to be clear, in our example, the seminal fluid is expelled from a consenting, age-appropriate adult urethra into a consenting, age-appropriate adult vagina, for the mutually desired purpose of procreating. So after expulsion, it gets surprisingly more complicated than the awkward sex education video you may have had to watch during health class in junior high school. You know, like the one where the starter pistol goes off and a bunch of dudes in white swim trucks dive into a swimming pool and race toward a woman clinging to a floaty at the other end. As it turns out, it's not quite as simple as just launching into a vagina and swimming to an egg. If you remember from the last episode, Mature sperm cells stored in the epididymis are not yet motile, and they are also missing components necessary to get through the layers of membrane that surround the oocyte, so fertilization can even happen. And in order to acquire motility and these components, they need to initiate multiple signaling cascades at different junctures between ejaculation and contact with the oocyte. These cascades kick off physiological and biochemical changes in the sperm cell in a process called capacitation. Capacitation gives sperm the capacity to not just reach the oocyte, but to also undergo a process called acrosome reaction, which is the final biochemical action that enables the sperm to crack through the layers of membranes surrounding the oocyte. I confess it's not super clear to me which specific aspects of capacitation happen at what point along the sperm cell journey to the oocyte. I think I can give a general overview of some of the mechanisms. I just may not have the exact timing, but you can explore that more on your own. Now, mammalian sperm cell capacitation seems to be mostly studied in vitro, which usually means in a Petri dish, with a medium that resembles different environments sperm cells interact with along the way. And often mouse models are used to make inferences about human sperm cell capacitation. So hold everything I'm about to say fairly loosely. Okay, so what does happen to sperm cells during capacitation? Well, we could spend an entire episode on just the changes in the flagellum and its acquisition of motility alone. 
It's incredibly remarkable what has to happen in seconds, really, to get sperm partially capacitated, possibly before they even leave the urethra. I won't get into everything that happens because that involves nearly as many acronyms as there are sperm cells, but one particularly significant change is cholesterol efflux, which means a bunch of cholesterol leaves the sperm cell membrane, altering the ratio of cholesterol to phospholipids. You'll have to go back a few episodes to cell physiology for more information on cell membrane physiology. But if you remember, cholesterol is interspersed within the phospholipids of the membrane, and its main job is to help control membrane fluidity. It's possible that cholesterol efflux will help increase sperm fluidity, motility, and membrane permeability. As cholesterol leaves the membrane, it makes more room for more ion channels, which allows for loads more ion exchanges that are involved in all of those necessary capacitation chemical signaling cascades. One of the more abundant ions that will play many signaling roles in capacitation is calcium. So at the point of ejaculation, again, motility capacitation is underway and at some point, possibly in the fallopian tube, hyperactivation of motility will occur as part of the capacitation process. And the last part of capacitation, which may also be underway in the fallopian tube, is the destabilization of the acrosome cap on the sperm head. So when it makes contact with the oocyte, it can kick off an acrosome reaction, which releases enzymes that help crack through the oocyte membrane layers. I'll explain what I can of the acrosome reaction when we get to the oocyte, but let's look a little more closely at the environment the sperm cells have just been launched into because that is also nothing like the pool in that junior high video. Unless it was a pool of sulfuric acid surrounded by an advancing army of Pictish warriors firing flaming arrows at anything that moved, which to be honest would have made a much more effective video. But let's rewind a bit. So we are at the point of expulsion. The sperm cells are acquiring motility. And if you remember from the last episode, I briefly mentioned that when the seminal fluid is projected into the vagina, it likely pools in the anterior vagina near the cervix. Now, as mentioned, the vagina is very acidic, but as we get further down the reproductive tract, it gets more neutral and even alkaline the closer we get to the fallopian tubes. But because the vagina is acidic, sperm need protection. So within a minute of being deposited in the anterior vagina, the seminal fluid coagulates into a kind of clot, holding the sperm cells hostage momentarily. It's suspected that this serves as a purpose to allow time for further capacitation and to protect the sperm while the alkaline seminal fluids have a chance to temporarily neutralize the acidic environment. The vaginal environment is also equipped with an arsenal of immunological responses, and at least one of them comes in the form of phagocytic leukocytes to protect it from bacteria and other disease pathogens, because as I said, the vaginal opening is precariously vulnerable to the outside world. Leukocytes are white blood cells that attack bacteria and viruses and anything else it doesn't like. And if you remember from the cell physiology episode, phagocytosis is a digestive process where in this case, the leukocyte engulfs the target cell and then unleashes enzymes to digest it and then poops out whatever molecular waste it couldn't reuse. Imagine that times 100 million sperm cells. I bet you didn't think making babies was going to involve sperm poop. So the vagina is not amenable to anything it deems an invader, sperm cells included. So it initiates an inflammatory response when it detects seminal fluid. And interestingly, it could be the seminal fluid itself that signals to the vagina to launch the immune response, which I thought was a little brazen. But there must be some reason why it does this. And if it's not just for sperm selection purposes, there may be some downstream effect that eventually prepares the reproductive tract for successful fertilization and implantation. Because even though the seminal fluid tells the vagina to let loose the leukocytes, it also contains immune response inhibitors which coat the sperm cells while in the seminal clot. So when the prostate fluid part of the seminal fluid liquefies the clot minutes after formation, the sperm are freed but they are both buffered from vaginal acidity and shielded from immunological responses, like the duplicity of it all. Still, even with the seminal protections, millions of sperm cells will be eliminated by those environmental factors. 
Those that survive the vaginal defenses still have to make it through thick cervical mucus and folds before they can reach the uterus. And the cervical mucus is impenetrable or too unnavigable to irregularly shaped sperm that can't swim properly or are hydrodynamically challenged. If you remember from the last episode, sperm head shapes vary and only the most hydrodynamic will get selected to go through the cervix. However, the cervical mucus also has immunological defenses, and many of those sperm cells will also be phagocytosed before they can even reach the uterus. It's a brutal, highly conserved evolutionary selection process, and by the time sperm reach the uterus, the numbers have dropped considerably. How the surviving sperm make it through the cervix isn't as intuitive as it seems either. It's possible sperm cells are guided through cervical folds by long linear glycoproteins that make up the mucus microarchitecture. You won't find that in the junior high video either. Okay, so the remaining sperm cells have now entered the uterus. And this won't take long to describe because due to probably obvious limitations, there's very little research on sperm transport through the uterus. Sperm cells likely rely heavily on their own motility to reach the fallopian tubes. It's possible the uterus contributes to their transport through endometrial contractions, but that's not certain and it may depend on the individual, their age, cycle stage, and a slew of other things. There may also be an immunological response to sperm cells in the uterus. There is in some smaller mammals, and if true in humans, the model shows that sperm outnumber the immune cells when they first enter the uterus, but the ratio shifts as the sperm move through the uterus. And as they move through the uterus, their seminal fluid immunological shield wears off, leaving them vulnerable to phagocytic leukocytes. I think we should pause here for just a second and appreciate the brutal magic that is the miracle of your existence. Because by this point in the reproductive process, hundreds of millions of sperm cells have either died or are unable to get through the cervical mucus and are just waiting to die. And the ones that have made it may have to outrun cellular cannibals lurking in the uterine shadows ready to snack on the weaker among them. It's diabolical. But let's not forget, also probably mediated by their protector, the seminal fluid. So give yourself a wee hug. The tiny cell responsible for half your chromosomes had to go through Middle Earth to help make you. Okay, now, as the sperm cells ascend the uterus, they are faced with two fallopian tube openings to choose from. So how do they know which tube has the oocyte? Well, it used to be thought that it was just random luck and sperm cells just ended up in both tubes. But recent studies of mammalian sperm transport have discovered that sperm cells may use sensory-based navigation systems involving thermal, chemical, and physical signals. I find this so fascinating, but please keep in mind that none of this is super certain in humans and more research is required before we can make any confident assertions. But I wanna tell you about them anyway because they're kind of wild and amazing. So the first signal I'll mention is a mechanism called thermotaxis, and it involves sperm cells responding to temperature. So at ovulation, there's a temperature drop, and that creates a thermal gradient between the uterus and the ampulla area in the fallopian tube. The ampulla ends up one to two degrees warmer than the uterus. The sperm cells, I guess, are attracted to warmth or some signaling cascade directs them to swim up the gradient to seek out the warmer ampulla area. And of course, that's the area they're most likely going to come in contact with the oocyte. Another signal may be chemical in nature. So the oocyte, or if you remember, the outer membrane surrounding the oocyte is layers of follicular cells that went with the oocyte during ovulation. And those cells have all kinds of chemical business going on, including making progesterone. And it's possible these cells release chemical attractants that lure the sperm cells toward it in a process called chemotaxis. Progesterone appears to have the most compelling effect as it seems to strongly influence and direct sperm cells toward the ampulla. Another interesting signaling mechanism, this time physical, is rheotaxis. And that's when sperm cells are reoriented to swim against a current And this could happen when fluid in the fallopian tube is pushed toward the uterus by cilia and peristalsis 
as it aids oocyte movement, creating a kind of current flowing out of the fallopian tube. This current signals to the sperm cells to reorient themselves and kick harder to swim against the flow toward the source of the current, guiding them into the tube. Again, we're not certain to what extent these mechanisms occur in human sperm cell transport, but still, I'm just always slightly blown away that our teeny tiny cells have the capacity for such complex operations. Like, while we're just kicking back watching turtles eat watermelon on YouTube, there are a ridiculous number of highly complex, coordinated, intricate processes on the go inside our bodies we're not even really conscious of. And I also say this because I hope it helps provide a little more context for anyone out there who is having challenges with fertility or conception or knows someone who is. There are layers on layers on layers of coordinated physiological mechanisms and feedback loops happening at molecular, even ionic levels in order for both gametes to just get to a fallopian tube before fertilization can take place. And though that's beautiful and amazing, if any of those processes get interrupted or become dysregulated, or if one aspect of one process falls off the rails, it could cause a cascade of effects that may or may not resolve. The etiology of some infertility issues can be very, very difficult to pinpoint. And that doesn't mean they can't be compensated for. It's just a gentle reminder to be kind and supportive to those around you experiencing these challenges because trying to conceive while addressing infertility can be a long and arduous and frustrating and painful and invasive process that can really take a toll on physical, emotional, and psychological well-being, especially when so much of what's happening is unfairly outside of anyone's control. Okay, so our remaining sperm cells have entered the fallopian tube, possibly guided by those thermal, chemical, and physical mechanisms. We may be down to only a few hundred sperm cells by this stage, but as far as I can discern from the literature, the fallopian tube environment is rather amenable to sperm cells, you at least won't find attacking leukocytes here. In some mammalian species, the fallopian tubes have a reservoir where sperm cells hang out before the final trek to the oocyte, a bit like an airport lounge. But it's not clear if human fallopian tubes have reservoirs. There seems to be evidence suggesting there is and there isn't, though there may be another kind of detaining mechanism in the way the tube lining forms mucosal folds. It's thought that these folds slow the advancement of the sperm cells, especially as they get closer to the ampulla section of the fallopian tube. They form mucosal pockets that sort of store sperm and only a portion will go on to find the oocyte. The fallopian tube fluids, which have increased during ovulation, help maintain the sperm cells and may assist with further capacitation because we're nearing the moment when the gametes unite and for a successful union to happen, Sperm cells need to increase thrust through the capacitation process called hyperactivation. And they also need to prepare for the acrosome reaction. So there are more biochemical changes that need to happen in order to facilitate both of these features of capacitation. It's possible that this detainment reservoir, or pockets, allows the sperm to acquire hyperactivation in order to release themselves from detainment. For sperm cells to acquire hyperactivation, they require a pretty intense internal signaling cascade, but it's not clear to me what molecules from the environment bind to receptors in the sperm cell membrane to kick off the signaling cascade. It's possible progesterone is that binding molecule, but interestingly, in a dish, sperm cells have been shown to spontaneously set off the signaling cascade. So I'm not certain how sperm cells know when to launch hyperactivation mode. I can speculate given their sensitivities to other taxis mechanisms I mentioned earlier. If you recall, rheotaxis is when sperm cells respond to fluid currents and activate physiological mechanisms to swim against the current, like a faster tail whip. Is it possible that the mucosal thickness and flow throughout the cavernous folds of the ampulla create a stronger current or resistance that mimics a positive rheotaxis against the sperm cell head, but requires hyperactivation to be able to cut through the current and navigate all the folds. I'm not sure, and hyperactivation isn't just increased velocity due to faster tail whip. The lateral movements of the head become more amplified and twisty in a kind of agitated way, and their trajectory is less linear and more erratic. 
a bit like a dog's response to the word walkies. And somehow these movements give the sperm cell more thrust to both search the ampulla folds for the oocyte and help penetrate the membranous layer surrounding it when they find it. So a small cohort of hyperactivated sperm cells will release themselves from the detainment area and search for the oocyte and possibly led by chemical attractants, they find it. Their hyperactivated movements plus an enzyme released from the sperm's outer plasma membrane begin degrading the oocyte's outer layer of follicular cells until they come in contact with the next membranous layer, which is the zona pellucida. And this is when the acrosome reaction kicks off because there is no penetrating the zona pellucida without this enzymatic reaction coupled with hyperactivation. Here's what happens. When the sperm cell comes in contact with the zona pellucida, it binds to the zona and the zona sends protein signals to the sperm cell that causes acrosomal cap membrane to fuse with the sperm's outer plasma membrane and they disintegrate in a process called exocytosis so that the special enzymatic contents of the acrosomal cap can spill out and disperse and get to work degrading the zona pellucidus protein matrix. This enzymatic degradation is the acrosome reaction. It clears a way for sperm cells to make contact with the oocyte plasma membrane, which is underneath the zona pellucida. When the sperm cells reach the oocyte plasma membrane, they will bind to it, but only one will fuse with it, and the first sperm cell to fuse with the oocyte plasma membrane triggers another molecular cascade that then hardens the rest of the zona pellucida and prevents other sperm from being able to fuse with it. The hardened zona pellucida will protect everything that's about to happen after fertilization. But right now, the winning sperm fuses with the vulnerable oocyte membrane and gets to plop its nucleus and other organelles into the oocyte. And this is it, lovelies. This is the beginning of you. Take a minute to take this all in. The journey these two gametes have been on to get to this moment is nothing short of spectacular. Out of hundreds of thousands of follicles and multiple starts and stops in the maturation process, which took a whole year, only one oocyte was selected to go on this mission. And of the hundreds of millions of sperm cells that were launched into Hunger Gamezilla, and underwent a bazillion changes and fought their way through inhospitable environments and dodged attacking leukocytes that their own pals invited and swam against currents and navigated caverns while engaged in a chemical version of Marco Polo with the oocyte. Only one got to fuse with it. I mean, how are we even here? But now, now the molecular fireworks begin. But we'll end it here and get into what happens next in the next episode. Your homework for this week is to watch a very short video of sperm hyperactivation posted in the show notes. Easy peasy. Okay, lovelies, thank you for being here. Again, please check out the STEM organizations in the show notes and support them or others in any way that you are able. I have no relationship with these organizations. I'm just a fan of the work that they're doing, and I hope that you will be too. If you like this episode, please click like and subscribe and the notification bell if you haven't already. Please share it with your friends, neighbors, and family and anyone you think would benefit from understanding their body a little better. Okay, lovelies, until next time, take care out there. Okay.